Okay, so I am very excited to introduce Wade Harrell. He's the owner of the Harrell House Bug Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Wade has been coming to Bug Fest in downtown Raleigh at the museum for 17 years. So you may, if you've been to Bug Fest before, you probably have met Wade. He's got the tarantulas and scorpions table always on the first floor of the museum. Um, so he's going to tell us today about bugs in movies. So without further ado, Wade, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, normally, yeah, you would see me with a bunch of spiders and things, and I have a bunch of spiders here with me today because spiders are probably the, the biggest movie star villains of the bug world. But I do have a lot of other creatures uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, and... You know, of course, you know, bugs have been very uh, common in movies, especially as villains uh, for a very long time. Uh, probably the earliest bug movie that starred giant bugs was a movie called Them uh, that, from the 50s. It was about giant ants. Um, and, I, and, and I don't have any ants to show, so I, but I do have some other bugs. Um, and I was going to start with one of the most common and successful uh, insects on our planet, and those are the cockroaches. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to show some cockroaches here, but first I want to show a clip that stars um, that that stars uh, cockroaches. A movie uh, from 1972, or I believe, called Bug. And if uh, I think Miranda's going to play the video, this is a trailer. The air hung heavy with the heat. Then it happened. A crack in the land that reached to the very bowels of the earth itself, spitting out the fires of hell. And the gleaming black bug that had no eyes and looked like a rock. It traveled in the exhaust pipes of cars, making fire, killing, and infesting the land with a burning terror. Wherever you turn, the bug was waiting, ready to grasp you in its soul-chilling grip of terror, to push you beyond human endurance, and leave you in a state of blood-boiling fear that will drag you to the brink of your sanity. One man was determined to learn its secrets, to discover how it grew and what it needed to survive. The Parmiteras will eat only raw meat, any kind. At first, it ate only ashes, but now it needed meat, and it would get that meat from whatever source it could. It was a creature from hell, and nothing could stop it. The bug lives. The bug grows. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary as the bug brings you the ultimate experience in terror. A terror so real it will make your skin crawl, your heart pound, and your soul scream for release from the bug. You won't live alone if you live at all when the bug comes hey everybody. to your house. I'm back. Did I, I guess the video is done. Everybody hear me? I'm not still muted, am I? No. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, you guys, you guys, everybody can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> I hope that clip wasn't too disturbing for anybody. Uh, that was that was from the movie Bug, and cockroaches have been used in tons of other movies. Uh, what I liked about that clip in particular, though, it shows two species of cockroach. Um, and, and because if you've ever seen that movie, it, it's about these cockroaches that come out of a you know the earth cracks open during an earthquake, and these subterranean cockroaches come out and uh, they start attacking people. And then for some reason, the scientist guy decides to crossbreed those cockroaches with some of the cockroaches in his house, and they turn into some new mutant kind of cockroach that eats human flesh. Um, but it, it, it's a completely ridiculous movie. That can't really happen, of course. Um, but what I thought found interesting is I did use two species of cockroach um, 
in, in that movie uh, for the different phases. The, the the first ones they showed were these guys. These are called giant cave cockroaches. And I don't even know if this is an adult, and you can tell it's got wings. You can see how big this cockroach is next to my hands. It's very large. This is about a three and a half, four inch cockroach. Um, and it, it they're called giant cave cockroaches because they are often found in caves in the uh, in Central and South America, but not exclusively. They also live in the forest. But they are one of the largest species of cockroach in the world. You can see his waving antennas there. But in the movie, oops, <laughs> they're not great flyers, but they are good gliders. They kind of, uh, they like to fall with style, as you would say with, with Buzz Lightyear. But this is the, a nymph. This is an immature version of one of those cockroaches. Because with insects, they, you know, if they're winged insects, they don't have wings until they're fully grown. So this is not a fully grown cockroach. This is the nymph stage. It will eventually, it will shed its skin and it will have wings just like the one I was showing you before. But in that movie clip, this was one of the species that they were using. And, I, and they were using the nymphs in particular, I think because they just look so prehistoric, like trilobites or something like that. And uh, they're very, they're, but um, unlike the movie, of course, uh, uh, hopefully I don't have to tell people they don't actually want to eat human flesh. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they also, and, and in that movie, the cockroaches can actually start fires with their rear ends. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the real cockroaches, of course, cannot do that. Now, uh, cockroaches are, get a bad rap because there are a few species that are pests to us. There's about five species that are the major pests that, eat, uh, that will live in our houses and be a nuisance. But most of them would prefer to live in the forest and eat dead, decaying leaves and logs and things of that nature. And they do an important job. They break down that plant matter and turn it into a soil that will help new plants to grow. So cockroaches are really good guides in the environment. And even the pest species are mostly just a nuisance to us. There can be some, if you have a really bad infestation of cockroaches, it can, um, it can cause you some respiratory problems because they're accumulated frass, which is a nice way of saying bug poop, and dead cockroach parts, hey, jump right off, uh, can, cause, um, can cause people with asthma and other respiratory problems, uh, asthma and other respiratory issues uh, problems with breathing, but uh, they don't actually carry germs that much because they actually groom themselves constantly. They're, they're like little cats. They're always licking themselves and cleaning themselves of any debris. Now, these are the other species of cockroach that you see in that video. These are Madagascar hissing cockroaches, and these have uh, these have uh, been very popular uh, in zoos, museums, pet stores, everywhere uh, for many decades now. Um, but you see them all the time in the movies. You see them in everything from movies like Creepshow, uh, which is a horror movie, or Men in Black, um, where the giant cockroach guy from space showed up and he's, he, these cockroaches are crawling all over him. Uh, they're very popular in movies because for a couple of reasons. One, they don't fly or anything. This is a, spe a species that's wingless, even as an adult. And they also um, do, uh, they also won't become a pest on the, you know, on the, at the movie studio, if they escape during filming, they will die because they really need more moisture than they're going to be able to find in most buildings. Um, I'm going to see if I can get one of them to make it sound. They make a hissing noise as a defense. Anybody? A little bit of a hiss. I don't know if that probably didn't come through. That guy's a little louder. We can, we can hear it. You can hear the hissing? Oh, yeah. good, good. Yeah, and so that's a defense to startle predators. Mine get picked up all day. Uh, so they don't always hiss because they're kind of used to people handling them. But they're, but um, like I said, this is not a species that ever be a pest in the house. They're, they're, they're actually popular as pets, as you know, people who want a pet cockroach. Uh, this is the one you're probably going to be able to find, and they do make the best pets. Um, if we look carefully, uh, hopefully we can zoom in and see this. Um, they have little tiny bugs that live on them. Speaking of how clean cockroaches can be. These, uh, if you see the, if you can see the bugs crawling on the cockroach, those are symbiotic mites that live exclusively on the hissing cockroach. This kind of mite only lives on this species of cockroach. It actually helps it stay clean. It eats mold and fungus that tries to go on the cockroach, and it also eats the cockroach's saliva because cockroaches drool a lot when they eat, and so that, um, so so that's their main food for these mites, and that's probably the reason they can uh, only live on the hissing cockroach is because that's the only source for cockroach drool. <laughs> All right. 
Now, I want to uh, I want to talk about another kind of bug, and I've got another clip uh, from the movie um, from an old uh, movie from the fifties called The Deadly Mantis about a well, surprise, surprise, a giant praying mantis. And if we could play that one now. Where are the bodies? Easy. In all the kingdom of the living, there is no more deadly or voracious creature than the praying mantis. You think you'll be able to drive it out to sea? I hope so. Every device of military science, every defensive weapon, radar, planes, rockets, marshaled to destroy a thousand tons of beastly fury. A monster leaving a trail of carnage spreading panic across a continent. Give me the alert button. Yes, sir. <laughs> Nothing in its path was safe. Not the planes in the sky. Not the ships at sea. Mamma mia! Or the vehicles on the ground. You boys might just as well go back. There aren't any bodies. And then this most dangerous monster that ever lived challenged the security of our city. Oh, wait, I think you're muted. <laughs> We're oh. muted, yeah. Oh, okay, good. All right, you guys unmuted now? Yeah. All right. So, um, so that was the giant, that was the deadly mantis. Mantises haven't appeared in as many movies as some of the other creatures. In fact, mantis is one of the few insects that a lot of people have a positive association with because they, we know that they eat other bugs and we see that as beneficial. Uh, how, however, they are intimidating predators. I'm going to first show you here. Uh, some preserved man mantises we have. I'm going to get a live one shortly, but these are some of the uh, preserved mantises in Oliver Greer's uh, mounted insect collection that we have on display here at the museum. And you can see they come in an amazing variety of shapes and colors. A lot of people don't realize that mantises have wings that can fly because normally their wings are tightly folded to their bodies. But um, they, but many, most mantises can in fact fly. Nearly all of them have wings. And, but some of them have are really amazingly camouflaged. They really look like leaves. Uh, some of them, this one, this one looks very much like a twig. This one looks like a dead leaf. You can see that. And we even have the orchid mantis, which unfortunately mantises after they're dead tend to dry out and lose their color. But this is an orchid mantis in life. It'd be bright white pink with some purple in it. But they're just really, really gorgeous creatures. These guys are, have like a shield-like thing on the back that looks like leaves. Um, but you can see, they, you know, there's thousands of species of mantises, so they're they're pretty uh, they're a pretty diverse group. But they're all predatory. They use their front legs, their spiny spiny and hooked front legs, to grab their prey. A large mantis is like Wade, this guy here. We have a question. We have a yes. question from the chat. Is it um, Mark wants to know? Is it true that only males have wings? Uh, no, no. Um, it, it, it in many mantises. The, uh, the female will have short wings and the male will have long wings, but in some, the female also has long wings. Um, there are some species that that's probably true for, but in general, no. Uh, if you see a mantis without wings, in most cases, at least in the United States, it's going to be a, um, it's going to be an immature mantis. Uh, as I said earlier with the cockroaches, uh, they, they don't have wings until their adult stage. 
Uh, however, there is one species that is found in North Carolina, by the way, is uh, called the Bruner's walking stick mantis. That is a species that looks like a walking stick, but it's actually a mantis. And uh, it actually has no wings on either. Uh, actually, there's only females known from that species and they reproduce parthenogenically, but they do not have wings at any stage. But most mantises do. Although the size and shape of the wings can vary uh, depending on sex. So Wade, I have a, I, um, Hannah says, wow, said that she never knew how many there were. So how many mantises species, species are there and, and what is their distribution? Are they on most continents? Uh, yeah, they're, I mean, obviously not Antarctica. All the other continents have mantises. Um, and off the top of my head, I feel like there's about 2,000 species, I want to say. I could be totally wrong. You might want to Google that and see if I'm right. It might be more. Uh, I think in the United States, we have a few hundred. Uh, most of them are tropical. Most of them live in the warmer parts of the world. But there are, you know, of course, some in the United States. The really big one that we see in the United States is called the Chinese mantis. It's actually an introduced species about 100 years ago where, where they were introduced into this country for pest control purposes or something. But now they're very common. They're the ones you see that are like, you know, you know almost four inches long. Most of the, uh, the, our native ones are mostly two to two and a half inches. But I've got a live mantis over here I want to show you. It's really neat. This is called, this is an African mantis. This is called a ghost mantis. Um, and you can see that it's extremely well camouflaged for dead plants. I mean, usually they look crinkled like a leaf. They can be green like this one. Sometimes they're brown or light tan. Uh, sometimes they're yellow, but they just really look like a leaf. And you can see how this is a female and she does have wings actually. Um, you can see that she's kind of shifting back and forth. Um, and, and that's because they part of their camouflage is to move back and forth like a leaf blowing in the wind. And so she's, you can also see how she's turning her head to look around. Um, they are actually, uh, see if I get her around so you can see what her face looks like, but she keeps looking at me. Mantises are interesting and they're one of the few insects that really look directly at us. Um, and she's looking at the camera now. I'm not she's back at me, but, <laughs> but you can see one unique thing about mantises there is they can turn their head. Um, most insects have their head, have very limited or no head movement, can pretty much look in one direction all the time. But mantises can actually turn their head. This is probably an important feature for them because they're predators and they often they specialize in catching fast moving and flying prey. So they have to have really good eyesight in order to capture that kind of bug. You know, this, this uh, mantis would have no problem catching a house fly or a bee or a moth, some other flying insect. And they have good eyesight and they and they're very fast reflexes. You can see her looking around there. But the camouflage level on this mantis is is uh, through the roof. Um, they they would be very, very difficult to find in their natural habitat. On my finger, it's very easy to see. <laughs> All right. So right. yeah, I think, um, uh, from the chat, Wade, um, everybody loves her. And, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, Paula wants to know, what does it eat? They're, they're predators. They eat insects. Uh, the, uh, most mantises will eat any prey they can overpower. They're very voracious predators. Uh, some of the bigger species uh, will eat, you know, even things up to including vertebrates, uh, small lizards. And there you can find pictures on the internet of some of the large mantises eating hummingbirds, which is... Don't look that up unless you like to see something really horrifying. But the ghost mantis is a small species. They prefer flying insects. So we feed them house flies, sometimes very small crickets or moths and things of that nature. They're, they're, the, the, I found that the really camouflaged looking mantises usually prefer a small flying prey. They're usually not as bold as some of the less camouflaged looking ones. I don't know if that means anything or not. Um, any other questions about the mantis? No, we're everybody's just in. Everybody likes her a lot. All we think right. She's very cute. All right. So if we could play a little bit of that Harry Potter clip um, that we had on there.
Gojo. Imperio! <laughs> Nobody is completely harmless. <laughs> What are you laughing at? Oh, get up! Talented, isn't she? What should I ever do next? Jump out the window? Oh, Wade, you're muted again. Hang on. Hi. Okay. Um... Well, so that was a very famous scene from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And uh, in the, I don't know if, how many of you have read the book, when the book where you just says a spider, but in the, um, in the movie, for some reason, they chose to use a, uh, a different arachnid. It's not actually a spider. That, that, believe it or not, though, that strange creature that they used is a real animal. It was a, that was CGI in the movie, of course, but it is based on a real creature, and I have a live one right here. This is called a whip spider. And, and this is the creature that they modeled um, that, that creature after for the CGI. And it is a very fast moving guy. Yeah, you see, I don't want to mess with him too much. I don't want to jump off the wood here. But you can see he's got these extremely long and thin and very delicate looking front legs. That's why we call it a whip spider. It's not a true spider, uh, but we call it a whip spider because it is very spider like in appearance. They're also called tailless whip scorpions because like scorpions they have like claws on the front of their body up oh, he's opening them up now he's pretty mad but you can see him now they're very spiky claws that's how it grabs its prey so a lot of people say this oh it's like a cross between a spider and a scorpion it's like well it's not exactly correct because they do belong to their own arachnid order <laughs> i'm gonna have to put him back in the cage here before he takes a leap but i'm gonna hold him over the cage that way if he, he'll pull in there but um uh, but uh, he, but unlike scorpions, he doesn't have a stinger. He has no venom, and he also has, so he has no venom at all. Which nearly all spiders also have venom. He also makes no silk. Silk is actually the thing that really makes a spider a spider and separates them from other arachnids. All spiders make silk, and this this creature does not make silk. Uh, so it, so it is in its own arachnid order. But it is something we get a lot of. Uh, recognition here when people are look see it in the cage you go like hey that's the one from harry potter and I'm like yeah, yes exactly i suspect he probably used this creature instead of a spider because there's some giant spiders that figure in some of the other movies um so they didn't want to uh get get our arachnids confused i guess but uh you can see that this guy is a very unusual creature there's not very many different kinds of these there's only around uh, 85 or so different kinds of whip spiders, or maybe it's 130 now. I forget exactly how many, but not very, that's a very small number compared to actual spiders who have more than 50,000 different species. So there's an incredibly large number of spiders and a much lower number of these guys. They're a very small order in comparison. However, some of them, they may be a small order, but some of the creatures are actually quite large. Um, one of another, uh, so we, we've got a few questions while you're, oh, so uh, sure. Emily wants to know if they use their pinchers to eat and hunt prey. Yes, the big claws, the pincher-like things up front are for grabbing prey. Uh, they will also, they can also pinch defensively. They don't have any venom, they don't bite or sting or anything, but they might pinch as a defense. And um, Paula wants to know why it has those long legs. Well, the legs on six of its legs are for running. They are very fast movers, as you saw in the, uh, when I had them out. Uh, but the very front legs are extremely long because they're used for feeling. They're, they, they don't have true antennas because arachnids don't have antennas, but they do have what we call antenna form legs. And they are front legs that are long and thin and are used like antennas. In fact, if you want to see just how long, uh, this is a uh, whip spider from South America, the largest species. Uh, this one is about two feet across. Like turn, there's a, like a oh. glare, yeah. yeah. And Hannah says she knows someone who got bit by them, but I guess pinched. Is, is well, you're saying pinched, they yeah, and if, and if there was any venom involved, it was probably something else. But if, but they can, they can definitely pinch. And you can see this thing is, is um, you know, bigger than my hand, even if it's 
regular walking legs are pretty long, but it's front feeler legs. And this mount is extremely all the way out. This is another uh, critter from Oliver Greer's um, uh, Crawley Wood collection that we have here at the Bug Museum. And this, it, and this guy is a little bit more than two feet across. This is an enormous. Yeah. So I have a question. So those front pinchers are there? More, are those more like like a scorpion's keely or more like a spider's pedipalps? Well, they are like the the pedipalps. Um, uh, they are the pedipalps. Yes. And so okay. the um, uh, uh, and all arachnids have pedipalps. It's just spiders are just like a shorter version of the legs. But some like the scorpions and the whip spiders, they have the spiny ones for prey capture. So they're you can so, see it's very spiny. Really spiny. So, yeah. um, so Adrian's asking where they're found, and I know you said South America, but they're in. I think I've seen them in Central America. So, do they? How far yes. north do they come? Uh, well, there's there's a variety of species, um, like, like around a hundred or so, uh, and a lot of them are South and Central America. So, there's actually a lot of different ones. Uh, you know, there's probably more in Central and South America than anywhere else. Um, but they do come up into the, uh, through Mexico and into the southwestern United States. We do have a few native species. Um, there's like one found in Texas, one found in Arizona, and there's one found in southern Florida as well. Um, those guys, however, are a fraction of the size of this guy. Like their whole body would, you know, um, you know, would be smaller than my fingernail. You know, they're, they're fairly small creatures. Uh, with their whips spread out, the Arizona one, might be four to five inches across with his whips all the way extended um but his but he's a much smaller creature overall but yeah we do have them and they look very similar to this otherwise uh just much smaller they're often found in caves one of their common names is also cave spider um so you will uh, occasionally see him referred to as that and you can see him on a lot of the um uh, Caribbean islands, especially if you happen to go, you decide to go spelunking, <laughs> you might encounter them. They are pretty common in caves. Any more questions about the whip spider? I think that's it. Okay. And now let's see the, uh, the scorpion, the black scorpion trailer. Beware than the scorpions. The black scorpion destroys communication. Hundreds annihilated. never achieved before by any science fiction picture. Thousands in the cast. So the black scorpion is, uh, <laughs> was one of the movies that came out after them, the giant, uh, the giant uh, ant movie I mentioned earlier. And uh, one of the things about what was funny about them is that they kind of concealed what the monster was for the first like 30 to 40 minutes of the movie. And it was a big deal in their marketing that got people really interested to see the movie. In the black scorpion, they did the same thing in the movie. They take forever to reveal what the creature is, but they forgot they titled the movie The Black Scorpion. <laughs> so not much of a surprise when it was finally revealed. Um, the special effects of that movie were done by a guy named Willis O'Brien who had created the special effects for King Kong. He was the guy that basically invented uh, stop motion animation. Um, 
And the scorpion is the scorpions in that movie are actually pretty good, uh, I think, except for when they show the scorpion's face with the big googly eyes and its drooling mouth, and that's not what scorpions actually <laughs> look like. But in the other parts of it, it look pretty good. Um, I have here a black scorpion. This is called an emperor scorpion. And this is, in fact, the only type of scorpion that I will routinely pick up and handle, like hold in my hand like this. Most species of scorpions will sting you um, if they get the chance. Uh, but the emperor scorpion very rarely chooses to sting. I don't know why exactly. Uh, it's kind of a mystery to me, but they, they, they usually don't. You can see he does have a stinger here on the end of his, of his tail. Uh, the, the, the venom of emperor scorpions is very mild. If it were to sting me, it would hurt a bit, but that's all. It's not considered a dangerous scorpion at all. Uh, it does have very powerful, broad pinchers, as you can see. Uh, and it may be that it uses those pinchers as its main weapons and really doesn't need to sting um, as often as other scorpions usually do because its pinchers are so powerful. So that's possibly part of the reason that it doesn't sting. But uh, it... Um, and scorpions are very ancient creatures. They've been around uh, way before the dinosaurs. They, at one time, they were even believed to be the first creatures living on land. Uh, that has since uh, been proven to be untrue. The reason they were confused about it was that um, the earliest fossils that were found of scorpions turned out to be aquatic scorpions. Uh, so Hugo wants to know, um you know, so scorpions glow under a black light. And he wants to, I know that, and I know what is really interesting is that it's structural. So even um, like fossil scorpions glow, right? Um, and he wants to know, what is the purpose of that? Nobody is sure what the purpose of it is. It may just be a holdover from their evolution because fluorescing under ultraviolet is actually fairly common among many invertebrates in the ocean, uh, but it's very rare on land. And, and so it may just be a holdover because they actually avoid light, especially ultraviolet light. To a scorpion, ultraviolet light means they're in the sunlight and their instinct is to hide. However, as it happens, I have a black light right here. I can show you that. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah, we don't, uh, yeah, and, and like I said, I don't really know. You can see it's getting a little uncomfortable. It doesn't really like the light, so I'm going to take that away. But um, it, uh, it, it is just kind of a mystery, but it sure makes it easier for us to find them. They do know it's a protein uh, compound in their exoskeleton that fluoresces, but we don't actually know uh, what benefit it has to the scorpion, if any. Uh, it's possible that it has something re related to moisture retention, uh, scorpions are most diverse in desert habitats, and they're really successful in deserts, uh, and, and their bodies can retain moisture uh, for a very long time. So it could be just the chemical they need for that waterproofing. Um, that, uh, you know, but, uh, but the, the trade-off is that they have to hide from the sun. They're so, um, and they're just so cool. They, look, they seem so, like, crustacean-like to me. Yeah, um, they, really, they seem like sea creatures, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, they really do. So Paula wants to know, what does it eat? Does it pinch? Because it didn't seem to be pinching you. It didn't pinch me that time. I have been pinched by them. They're quite powerful. Um, actually, I can show you the scorpion that pinched me the hardest. Uh, it's no longer alive, but not because it pinched me. But <laughs> but uh, I love uh, I love how you say that it didn't pinch yeah, me. Yeah, I wanted to throw that in there. This, um, these are some of our mounted scorpion specimens. And, and this is an interesting case because the scorpions in this case were all things that I had alive at one point. And when they died their natural death, uh, Oliver Greer uh, mounted them for, to add to the bug, to add to, the, to our exhibits here. And this is um, a giant, this is the scorpion that actually pinched me the hardest. This is called a flat rock scorpion from South Africa. And stretched out like this, he's nearly 12 inches long. Uh, but it clamped onto my finger with those claws one time and did not want to let go. It was extremely painful. Uh, I stopped handling that scorpion after that. Um, but it, did, it, but it, it didn't sting you? It didn't sting. Uh, I've been told by somebody who's been stung by him, it does have a very painful sting, but uh, it, is, it is not known to be deadly. This is an emperor scorpion, actually. Um, this is a very much bigger than the one I was just handling. You can see how big that was. This was the one that actually got the bug museum started because 
I had this on display in one of my uh, in a kiosk where I was selling some toys and things. And Oliver Greer saw this and had to buy it for his collection. And that's how he got st started talking about making the Bug Museum. Um, and interestingly, this is a Death Stalker scorpion. This is actually the most dangerous species of scorpion in the world. Uh, they they have extremely powerful venom. Uh, and, and it's drop for drop. It's some of the strongest venom in the world, actually. Uh, but it, because they don't inject that much, most people who get stung by it do survive. But it is a very dangerous thing for, you know, toddlers, you, you know, little kids, or elderly people with, uh, with compromised immune systems would have to watch out for that. And, of course, they get where are, and where are the emperor scorpions and the death stalker scorpions from? Death stalker scorpions like Middle Eastern. It's going to be in Egypt and... Israel and Saudi Arabia, those areas. The emperor scorpion is getting much farther south in Africa. It's a tropical forest species usually. So they're usually gonna found in, in, in forest um, areas. And it, I find it so interesting that the claw structure is so different. It, does that have to do with the prey? Well, in the, um, in the, in the scorpions like the emperor and the uh, flat rock scorpion who mainly kill their prey with claws, crushing their prey, they have much more powerful claws. The Death Stalker has very slender tweezer-like pinchers. They're in the scorpion family called Boothidae, which is uh, the family that includes most of the actually dangerous scorpions in the world. There's almost 2,000 species of scorpions and only about 25 of them that are actually considered dangerous to people. And they're all in that family and they have these thin tweezer-like pinchers. So usually, like a lot of people say, is it true the smaller ones are the most dangerous? And I'm like, well, no, because the dust stalker, you can see, is much larger than these other guys. And these guys are mostly harmless over here, uh, but, but, it, but it, so it's more of a medium-sized scorpion, but the pincher size can help, it would be a better, would help you make a better, better guess. But if you don't know for sure, I wouldn't recommend uh, touching any scorpion, <laughs> unless you know about scorpions. I don't think you have to worry about me. Most people Tom, don't feel but... fine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Um, so I've got, so Lisa said her son reminded her of a theory about them, um, about the fluorescence, about them feeling the light and hiding. Do yes, you... when, they, when they feel the ultraviolet light on, they will hide. So they do know, they can feel it. Okay. So they are aware that that ultraviolet light is on them. I think it, to them that means sunlight and we got to get out of it. Yeah. Especially I found the desert species respond to it even quicker because uh, you know, the, the sun from the desert, the heat of the desert is gonna be much more intense than in the forest. And so they're gonna go underground almost uh, immediately when that hits them. And Hugo now, wants to know, if they inject venom into their prey when they eat it, um, are they not affected by that venom? They won't be affected by the venom that they eat, no. They can actually sting each other some. In fact, part of, uh, scorpions actually can inject more than one different kind of venom. They're, they're still studying scorpion venom because it's being used in some cancer research and other things now. Um, but they do have different types of venom, depending on species. And some scorpions even sting each other as a part of their courtship. Um, uh, you know, when they're, when they're mating, the, 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 um, the, I believe the male will sting the female uh, as, as just part of the courtship process. That is very interesting. And Hugo also wants to know, is it true that the smaller sized scorpions are more dangerous than the big ones? Not exactly, because um, it, it's true in the sense that the really big scorpions, like your emperors and your flat rocks, they are, they are not going to be gen dangerous. However, like over here in the same case, we have these guys. These are very common where I live here in New Mexico. These are called devil scorpions. They're very common and they will sting you and it hurts about like a bee sting, but not particularly dangerous. Whereas the death stalker over here is a potentially de deadly scorpion, but you can see, as you can see, it's medium size. Now here in the United States, the only type of uh, scorpion that we have that's considered dangerous to people is the Arizona bark scorpion, which is um, like this guy here. Um, and they are a fairly small species, but by no means the smallest. There are smaller species still that are harmless, but they are fairly small. They get about two inches full length. Uh, it's the only species in the United States that's ever caused a death. Interesting. Uh, I feel like because like the way they're laid out flat with their tails not curled over their backs, they do look very aquatic to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Emily well, wants to know if death stalkers have killed people. 
Yes, they have. Um, like I said, it's usually going to be infants and toddlers who are most at risk of any scorpion sting, but they have caused human death. Um, it's usually people, either a baby or toddler or a, a, an elderly person with a compromised immune system who would be at risk. Very um, nice. I'm going to show you one more scorpion here before we move on to different bugs. This is a, uh, this is a, our biggest American species of scorpion, uh, called a giant desert, uh, giant hairy scorpion. Um, and this is one I will handle occasionally with caution. It's not nearly so, um, he does not. Yeah. He does not look yeah, like I just had a scoop him up. I'm not, I don't handle him as casually as I do the, um, emperor because he will sting, but, um, he's actually got an injured leg here kind of oh, twisted no. there. But um, that's old. He's had that. Uh, but uh, so these guys can get up to five inches. This is the biggest species of scorpions found in the United States. Um, and he also blows. Um, and, uh, and they're called hairy scorpions. You can, because they, they have, it probably might, might not be visible right now, but they have hairs on their claws and on their tail that are important uh, part of their sensory apparatus. But uh, most scorpions have that too. So but I just want to show you this uh, kind of neat. Well, they're actually one of my favorite kinds of scorpions. Um, they dig like little dogs in the sand. That's why we always keep a lot of sand with them. They kind of kick the dirt out from under them, just like a, just like when a dog digs. So uh, they they are one. But with his injured leg, so how often, when you know, is he full grown, and will he be molting? And his will, his leg will repair once he molts. If he molts again, it could repair. I, I suspect that's probably an adult. So probably won't. You probably just have to live with that. Okay. So so once they reach adulthood, they they cease molting? Yes. The scorpions, yes. Okay. In fact, with most arthropods, that's the case. But um, th but uh, there are a few exceptions that we will talk about soon. <laughs> um, let's show the... Uh, uh, now I want to show a scene uh, from the movie Dr. No, the first James Bond movie. Is it playing? No. Okay. There we go. Okay. scene you see James Bond played by Sean Connery being threatened by a tarantula and um, in that scene what was funny is that uh, Sean Connery's agent said absolutely no way is that spider to touch Sean Connery <laughs> and so when you see him actually before you see the actually you can see Sean Connery's face in the shot it's crawling over like a, a stuntman a double and then like when he's actually see him crawling up Sean Connery's shoulder there there's a piece of glass between him and, and the spider, which to anybody who knows anything about tarantulas is hilarious because tarantulas are not dangerous at all. Uh, it, it's, I've always still not 100% sure what species is used there because it's so dark, but I believe it's probably a pinto tarantula uh, that was used in that scene, but they're completely harmless um, to people. Uh, but I did, and I'm gonna show a clip with tarantulas 
uh, 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 the movie Tarantula is a monster movie, but I do want to talk about a few spiders that actually are dangerous. This is a black widow spider. Um, this is uh, this is the Western black widow that I, that's very common here in New Mexico. Um, and uh, in, in, we're in North Carolina, you have both the uh, Southern black widow and the Northern black widow. The, the Southern being the more common, they have the classic hourglass on their belly whereas the northern has more like red spots rather than an hourglass. But both species do occur there. Um, and, and Lily, if you can come zoom in from the top, maybe we can see the red marking on the hourglass there. Maybe not, but it's kind of dark on the specimen. But there she is. Um, now black widows, um, Black widows are indeed uh, very venomous. They do have uh, their, their venom drop for drop is stronger than rattlesnake venom, which sounds pretty scary. But the thing you have to remember is that black widows um, have very small amount of venom. They're, they're small creatures. So even though the venom might be more powerful than a rattlesnake's venom, I would consider a rattlesnake to still be a more dangerous animal because they can inject so much more venom. Um, it's also uh, uh, true that with rattlesnakes, they have large fangs to inject venom into their prey. But uh, black widow's fangs are very teeny tiny. It's actually very hard for them to bite a person. Normally, black widow bites occur because it's been trapped under an article of clothing. Um, like contractors have to crawl under buildings and things like that are more likely to bit by black widows because they'll knock into the web and they'll fall down their shirt or something like that. And that's typically how bites occur. Um, it, is a, it is a potentially dangerous bite. You do want to get it treated, but uh, deaths from black widow bites are extremely rare. I think it's been many years in this country since anyone's actually died from the black widow bite. But it is a very unpleasant experience. I don't recommend it. We did it. have one, um, one year at Bug Fest, we had one in one of the porta potties that we rented for the event. And, oh, we, okay. and we went and we went and got her and we got her out. We lured her with her egg sack, her egg case. <laughs> and then she ended up in the arthropod zoo. Oh, cool. Yeah, they are pretty common. I mean, I, I found like I used to live on the East Coast, uh, you know, and, and I, you know, usually before bug fest, I'd always want to have at least one black widow so I'd have to go out and find one. Here, I found that they're even, they're even more common, like in, in New Mexico. Like when I, if I need one for the bug museum, I just go in my yard and pick up the first rock and there'll be one living up there. I've even found them in uh, where our, our museum is in a mall and some of the back corridors in the mall, I've found them just living free range. Um, yeah, so they're they're very they're very common spiders. Um, if bites were causing a major epidemic in human deaths, uh, we would know because the spiders themselves are very very common. And I did want to show uh, this guy. This is a brown recluse spider. Uh, this is the other dangerous spider found in the United States. You can see this is a, a pretty small spider there. Uh, they can be a bit bigger than this. This particular specimen was raised in a laboratory, so not quite as big as they might get in the wild, but still not a big spider. And also kind of a nondescript looking spider. They're just kind of brown. Uh, they do have a uh, fiddle-like marking on their on their rear, uh, I mean on their carapace on the front half of their body. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of other spiders have that, and there are many other spiders uh, that get mistaken for brown recluses all the time. But we're in North Carolina, chances are you'll never see one unless you're in the extreme uh, western part of the state. Here in New Mexico, um, we also uh, don't really have them. You can see our map here. Um, you can find this map online. Uh, but, it, but it does show the red areas where the true brown are close. And I know everybody has a story about somebody they know getting bitten. And it is possible because they can get transported in, in um, crates and shipping boxes and things like that, but that's fairly rare. Most likely, uh, you know, or frequently, uh, black, brown recluse bites turn out to actually be um, uh, staph infections or MRSA infections and things like that. That's what, yeah, that is not so interesting. That's what I've heard as well. People always, you know, claim that they've been bitten by one of these venomous spiders, and it does usually end up being an infection. Um, so Paula wants to know, what does it eat? Well, uh, brown recluse spiders, uh, like most spiders, are general predators. They'll eat any kind of bug they can ever ca uh, encounter. But since they are fairly small spiders, probably most often it's flies, gnats, very small uh, insects that they that they eat. We. Um, when I've had them in the past, I've had them fruit flies. 
because uh, they are they are pretty small. Very cool. All right. All right. Um, I'd, um, unless there's another question, uh, like to show the our last movie clip from the trailer for the movie Tarantula. circumstances were to magnify one of them in size and strength, took it out of its primitive world and turned it loose and out. Then expect something that's fiercer, more cruel and deadly than anything that ever walked the earth. Even science was stunned. The new atomic miracle should have been mankind's greatest boon. Instead, when such power to cause phenomenal growth proved dangerously unstable, man was confronted with his most shocking blunder. The isotope triggered our nutrient into a nightmare. A blunder that transformed a tiny insect into the hundred-foot spider that was now ravaging the panic-stricken countryside. So <laughs> that was tarantula, personal favorite. Uh, tarantulas are kind of my specialty. Um, so I, we have a lot of tarantulas here at the Bug Museum. And, um, and tarantulas, of course, uh, you know, we saw one in the James Bond uh, clip as well. Uh, they are, uh, you know, one of the most maligned animals in the world, uh, but they're actually uh, no danger to us whatsoever. In fact, most tarantulas have other methods of defense uh, that they can use rather than biting. And if they do bite, their venom is actually very mild. So this is one of our uh, very gentle tarantulas. This is uh, called a golden knee tarantula from South America. And um, and she's a very gentle uh, uh, spider. She, uh, she, she. Their main defense is special hair back here called urticating hair, and they can flick this hair from their rear end into the eyes or nose of a predator. And it's like little, it's like little spines. It's very painful in the eyes. It's very irritating on our skin. But because they have it, they don't need to bite. Biting is really their last resort. And some species, like the golden knee here, um, will will become very calm in captivity and not flick the hair or bite. So she's very gentle. We appreciate that. Um, so Emily has a question about old world versus new world tarantulas. So what's the difference? Wow. She's very That's docile. Your there. Yeah, she's very docile. Uh, well, uh, one of the key differences is that those, the hair I mentioned. The hair is, uh, is found on um, primarily new world tarantulas. There's a few new world ones that don't have it, but uh, most of them do. And that is their main defense. And that may be why uh, old world tarantulas tend to be more willing to bite. Uh, old world tarantulas um, don't have that defense. And so they are more likely to resort to biting as a defense. Um, old world tarantulas also tend to have much more powerful venom uh, than new world tarantulas and uh, still not deadly to people but it can be excruciatingly painful. Uh, I was once bitten by a tarantula from Africa. And uh, just to say, I am much more careful with African tarantulas now. <laughs> I, do, I feel like at one bug fest, you had been bitten by a tarantula and were there like 
like neurological <laughs> i can't remember but i felt like I, yeah I, there was well, I, something I, going on <laughs> as far as i know i was never bitten at bug fest i got stung by oh no i think i don't think it was at bug fest i think you're oh, talking okay. about bug fest. yeah the african tarantula that bit me uh caused severe pain in my hand bad swelling uh and i had uh, like crazy muscle cramps for about two weeks after which just would randomly pop up in my neck or my leg or and, and it, it, yeah, that was a, so I did have some neurological effects from that. Um, uh, but so I, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm much, I got bit because it had tried to jump out. I had it in a container like this and I took the lid off this tarantula jumped out and took off across the floor and I had to corral it very quickly. And I grabbed it. And like when you, if you grab a tarantula just right across the middle like this, no problem. Um, which is much easier to do on a docile New World tarantula, but I failed to do it correctly on that very aggressive African tarantula, and I got nailed. Um, and um, in the in the future, I said, okay, next time that happens, I'm finding a cup and using a container. <laughs> I feel like the way you're holding her, it's like how I hold a box turtle. Um. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I, th so, I pick up tarantulas a lot. Now, if you yeah. do encounter them wild. I don't recommend handling them because uh, one thing they're not going to be used to being handling handled, and they might flick that hair at you. Uh, and our new world tarantulas are, are are tend to be less likely to bite, more reluctant to bite, but they still can and they still might. Um, and, and and none of them are dangerous. Uh, I was bitten by a tarantula in New Mexico once, and all that happened from that was two. I had two puncture wounds on the end of my finger, and that was it. I had no effect on venom whatsoever. But still not fun to you know get puncture wounds in your finger. <laughs> And they're so, also very delicate, aren't they? Like there's yeah, there's they, all yeah, these they are. Just hurting them. And if they if they take a fall, and you know a lot of things like can kill a tarantula. So if you encounter tarantulas in the wild, it's the best bet is just let them go on their way. Most often we see them uh, during the breeding season here in New Mexico. Uh, it's this time of year actually. The males are crossing the roads. Now you're not going to encounter them ever in New Mexico. I mean in, in uh, North Carolina in the wild. Uh, because, you know, we, we generally don't have tarantulas uh, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, however, there, that there, one there, species that's like that, that's like this teensy tiny species that um, I think is in the western part of the state and lives in tree bark. I think it, I think that is a Mygalomorph spider, okay. which is a tarantula relative. Uh, okay. Depending on the way you use the common name tarantula, like Theraphosidae is the family of spiders and I, and I don't, that, we, that I usually use for tarantula. Uh, the word tarantula for, and there are none of those in North Carolina, but there is one little um, uh, mygalomorph relative that's found in Western North Carolina, but also trapdoor spiders in that family as well. Um, so you do have those. So um, Emily has another question. Are flightless fruit flies only bred in captivity or are they present in the wild? I think in the wild, they occur, occur as kind of a random mutation. And so they created the flightless fruit flies by selectively breeding uh, the wild, the mutations of the wild fruit fly to, to breed them in captivity. So um, they what, there's, no, there's no species of fruit fly that's naturally flightless, as far as I know. I'm not an expert on flies though, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then Hannah has a question. Um, can they make wet, oh, so, so if you wanna ask that question, Emily, we do have um, two dipterists tomorrow giving talks and you can ask that. <laughs> and they are fly experts. Um, but Hannah wants to know if they can make webs, and if yes, how do they not break the webs? I guess because how, of how big they are. Well, all spiders make silk, um, but, uh, but uh, including tarantulas, in fact, I'll open the container and you can see, uh, Lily, if you can stand up and point the camera down here, you'll see a mat of silk here. Uh, she's laid this silk down inside her home. However, she does not build a web to capture prey. She doesn't make any kind of web that she could actually hang out in because you're correct. She is much too heavy to hang in a spider web. Um, so, uh, so she would not be able to build it. She, she captured her, she's kind of an ambush predator. She sits out in the open, waits for bugs to come by. The silk might help her sense of touch by laying it around her hole. That way when a bug touches it, she can feel the vibrations, but she doesn't catch bugs with it. She catches bugs by just going up and grabbing them. Uh, I want to show you one more tarantula here. Um, that is a, uh, this is a... Um, what's her name? Yeah, Amy uh, wants to know what her name is. <laughs> the, oh, the tarantula I just showed, uh, that was Nerissa. <laughs> 
Uh, so now this is a um, uh, this this is a Goliath bird eating tarantula, um, and uh, this is uh, the biggest species of spider in the world. Uh, and this is a male. Uh, this is a male Goliath bird eater. He uh, just re recently became mature. We're hoping we have a female here. We're hoping that they will make some baby Goliath bird eaters. And I'm going to put on some gloves. Not because of I'm worried about a bite, because with a Goliath bird eater, the gloves are not going to do you any good whatsoever because the fangs are more than an inch long. We can see that here on this molted exoskeleton of a Goliath. You can see how long those fangs are. They're about three quarters of an inch to an inch long. So they would go right through these rubber gloves. The gloves are to protect me from the urticating hair. Uh, Goliath bird eaters are more than willing to flick the hair. I don't usually hand these, handle these in demos, but I did want to show this guy off because he is an impressively big spider. And you can see, get, get there. <laughs> there he goes. He, he's kicking the hair. You can see that's his defense. You see that? He may also it... make a noise. He's also making a noise. Get the camera close so you can hear the noise. Can you hear that crackling sound? It's kind of like a snap, crackle, and pop guy. He's stridulating, and that's a, a, a sound that uh, some tarantulas can make. You can see he's a he's a big boy. Um, and one interesting thing is a lot of tarantulas, you can tell males and females because the males have hooks on their first pair of legs. Legs, but with the Goliath, the, um, the the males don't have hooks, but he has these boxing glove like uh, things on his pedipalps, and that's how we know he's a male. So, he's wait, a I have a question about that because that's usually why males um, tend to live not as long as females, right? Because those hooks they get hung up in their molts. And so, they, well, does that mean that he'll live longer than a typical male tarantula? Uh, well, only, I mean, it's theoretically possible that he could survive a molt uh, if he did go to a, a what we call a, a post-ultimate molt. Um, chances are he won't. Most males don't ever, don't ever try to molt again. Um, occasionally, it's kind of a rare occurrence, a male tarantula will try to molt again after he's fully grown. We call it post-ultimate molt. Uh, very rare uh, and usually, yes, the, um, the uh, hooks and the pedipalps often get stuck and we'll sometimes lose those appendages. But there have been a few cases, I know of uh, know some people who have had that experience with their pet tarantula and survived it. Uh, but usually they don't, they get stuck in the molt and die. But yes. it is actually pretty rare for it to occur at all. Okay, that's so interesting. So that isn't usually the, the cause of death then for the males? No, they usually just kind of, they don't molt, they just kind of gradually peter out, which is typical for most spiders. Uh, males and females alike. Uh, in most spiders, um, they'll mate, they'll lay their eggs, and then they just kind of decline and die. Um, tra female tarantulas are kind of the exception to the rule because they will contain a molt about once a year, and that kind of re seems to rejuvenate them. Um, Goliath breeders are a relatively short-lived tarantula. Uh, we had a female pass away who, who passed away at 12 years old, which for Goliath is actually pretty good. They usually typically live you know, seven to eight years on average. Um, uh, but some of the desert dry climate species can live much longer. Uh, we have a, a Chilean rose on display here who is 21 years old, old enough to drink this year. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that is actually all my, uh, all my critters. All right, so I have one question. Paula wants to know if he pinches. Or if what? If um, he pinches, like I, I think, um, but I think he, he has the fang, so I think he more is likely he, to bite. Yeah, he could definitely bite if he wanted to. He, he didn't try to bite me now as annoyed as he was. So they, like, the, most of the New World tarantulas will rely mainly on their hair. And you, can, you saw him kicking that hair. Uh, that they usually, like, that was bite. a really neat thing to see. Yeah, the hair is a... Um, is a better defense because it's a way they can defend themselves without having to come in contact with the predator. If they bite, they're right in, they're right in there with the predator and so the predator can harm them, but the hair kicking will drive away any predator with, a, you know, with eyes or mucous membranes. And Adrian wants to know what his name is. Oh, um, his name is Hans Friedrich. <laughs> <laughs> I have employees that come up with names for my, my bugs and I, I 
I think we used our old female Goliath that was really large. Her name was Brunhilda, so we tried to stick with this kind of German theme for them for some reason, even though they're from Brazil. <laughs> so fun. All right. Well, wait, thank you so much for this. This has been so much fun um, getting to see the live animals. So we really appreciate it. And hopefully next year we'll be back in in-person bug fest and you'll be back on the first floor of the museum. Yeah. That'll be great. I we'll look forward to it. Awesome. So let's see. I have to do the first. So uh, everyone, so please, um, if you'd like a memento of your bug, virtual Bugfest experience, you can uh, go to bugfest.org and reserve your shirt today, or you can join the museum or renew your membership and get one for free. So this is a perfect time to do that. I just wanted to say thank you to Wade for um, doing this program for us. It was so much fun. Thank you all for staying here and participating. Thank you to our sponsors, BASF and Terminex. And in about, a, in a few minutes at 6.30, you can join us for Buggy Guess and Sketch. Um, so we're, we're Miranda, Hugo, and I will be uh, doing our best to get you to guess some different uh, bug species based on our drawings. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, and the museum will be re, um, resuming operations uh, starting on Tuesday, so you can go to naturalsciences.org and reserve your time, your free time ticket to join us then. So, and tomorrow we have another full day of Bugfest programming, so we hope you can join us for another program then. Thank you so much. Goodbye.